Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello dear students, today we will tackle a system which is inextricably linked with our body, something without which we can't do absolutely without. This is the diseases of the immune system. We know that immune system is responsible for multiple reactions in the body. We will also try to know if there is a deleterious side to the immune system. We will tackle the basic fundamentals which are the role of the B and the T lymphocytes and along with some other cells of the immune system such as the macrophages, the dendritic cells, as well as the NK cells, and try to learn what are the roles they play in the immune system. Now, immune system is not a whole. It's actually a sum of many parts, meaning to say it's like a grid where each puzzle has a role to play to make the final picture. As we understand from our previous classes, and also a knowledge from literature that the organs which are involved in the immune system range anywhere between the lymph nodes, the spleen, the liver, and the bone marrow. But lesser known facts are some of the other organ systems which are equally, if not more important, such as, as you've seen on the screen here, the adenoids and the tonsils, which actually form the first line of entry or the portal from which the respiratory secretions, which may contain even the microorganisms. You may have the lymphatic vessels, which are conduits, which take all these organisms or even the antigens and present them to the lymph nodes. We have the thymus, which as we know is also a site for T cell differentiation. And also in the intestine, our gut system, which has the payers patches and the appendix, which are equally important in checking the organisms which can gain entry through the elementary canal. Apart from the T and the B lymphocytes, like I illustrated earlier, you have the other cells of the immune system, such as the neutrophils, the role of which, as we understand from our chapters from inflammation, range from phagocytosis to complete eradication of the organisms. You have the dendritic cells, which use their tentacles to drag in cells and process it in such a way so that they become palatable to respond by the T cells. You also have the monocytes, which of course become macrophages in the tissue system which have an important role of scavenging or phagocytosing the organism or the inciting insult. You have the mast cells, which release a lot of vasoactive amines, and these mast cells are important in some of the hypersensitivity reactions. And also sometimes forgotten are epithelia, which form a physical barrier, but also have some secretory function, which can impede any further progression of the antigen. Some of the other components such as the complement system, as well as the NK cells also have important contributions to the immune system. If asked as a straw poll, what are the types of immunity, the natural answers would be innate and adaptive, and we know what they are. Innate immunity are preformed, something that we are endowed with, and they are the primary source of defense against microorganisms. The problem with such an innate immunity is it is short-lived and it does not have a long-term memory. Though it eliminates the damaged cells, but the response is not a long-lasting one. In contrast, you have what is called as an adaptive immunity, which has a more robust and impactful response. It is stimulated by microorganisms, and it is processed or mediated by lymphocytes. Now, whenever we refer to immunity in general, the adaptive immunity is what we'll be speaking henceforth. Now let us take a couple of case vignettes to understand better as to the physiology of these cells and how they partake in the immune process. Now take the scenario of an 18 year old medical undergraduate who have to certainly mandatorily vaccinate against hepatitis B at the start of their course. As we understand the primary cause is the three doses and then the boosters, two boosters basically. At the end of one year it was found that the serum anti-HPS AG 
titers were found to be 746. More than 10 is considered to be protective. Now here was 746, certainly no case for worry. Just to draw a contrast, a second case scenario on your screen here. It's a 21-year-old student who develops an upper respiratory tract infection. The catarrhal phase of the infection worsened up to day 3 and it was seen that day 7 the infection resolved without any need for antibiotics. Now there are certain similarities between the two case vignettes which are put up on your screen now. You can see that they are affecting a similar age group. There is an introduction of a foreign system into the host but the reactions that have taken place at the end show a protective response. Either the patient has recovered from an upper respiratory tract infection or the serum titers which are protective are very high. Now those are the similarities in these two case scenarios. We will try to tackle the distinctions there. There are subtle differences between these two cases. We will try to understand them and hence in the process maybe understand the role of lymphocytes and other cells. Now scenario number one. Now as the, as the vaccine enters into the body system, it is obviously it is foreign, it has to be recognized by the host as foreign. What happens here? All these antigenic particles will be incident upon the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes B in this context, the B lymphocyte will recognize these antigens based upon the receptors that they harbor. Now the receptors are usually immunoglobulin which are IgM or IgG in nature. Now as it binds to the antigen binding sites on the receptor, there occurs a conformational change taking place in the immunoglobulin molecule. Now the conformational change has to do with some amount of dimerization and also there are some co-stimulatory molecules such as CD21. Some of these reactions may require the help of the complement system to complete the process but the cumulatively what results is what is called as a couple of signals. Now signal 1 is generated mainly by the changes, a conformational change in the immunoglobulin molecule but that signal itself is not enough for the cell to become activated. It requires a supporting role of a co-stimulatory molecule, in this case is also a transmembrane receptor which is CD21. Now when both of these molecules are activated by the same epitope or antigen, it results in what is called as signal 2. Now when both signal 1 and 2 are present, the lymphocyte from its baseline naive state becomes an activated lymphocyte, meaning that the lymphocyte is now ready to release all the products. May they, maybe it is immunoglobulins, maybe differentiate into a plasma cells, we will have a look at those in the ensuing slides. The lymphocyte differentiation is an important one as its journey from the naive B cell to an activated B cell can be of two types. It can be a T dependent mechanism where you require the T cells as a supporting role to secrete CD40 and CD40 ligands are the ones which in conjunction with the cytokines can cause an activated B cell. The other mechanism is a T independent one where because of the recognition of the epitopes you can see the lymphocytes transforming from a naive state to an activated state. Now once your lymphocytes are activated as you can see on your screen there is a clonal expansion of these lymphocytes meaning their tribe increases. So when there is an increase in the number of cells obviously their products increase. One of the things that can happen as you can see in the top of your screen here is them transforming into post germinal center cells which are your plasma cells. Now this is an important mode of differentiation because plasma cells are storehouses of immunoglobulins and they can produce a very large amount of these molecules. So antibody secretion is one of the important roles. Apart from this you can get what is called as isotope switching which means that lymphocyte which is devoted to formation of a certain immunoglobulin subclass can switch itself to produce another immunoglobulin maybe from IgA to IgG. This can happen at the level of the post germinal center cells and another important mechanism is affinity maturation that is the plasma cell will elaborate immunoglobulins which have an affinity to a certain microbe. So when there are subsequent microbial insults of the same nature already there are preformed antibodies which can counter these microbes in the body. And last but not the least is the differentiation to what is called as memory B cell. 
literally it retains the memory of inciting insult. So, when there is a similar epitope or an antigen which is delivered to the body, it can produce lot of immunoglobulins right up front. Now, this case scenario which is number 1 here, we saw the protective titer was 746. Now, this can explain why this titer was very high. When dose 1 was given, it was foreign, but it was picked up by the body's immune cells. When the dose 2 was given, you can imagine from this very chart that the memory B cells retain the memory of the previous antigen. There will be an increment in the units of the antibody titers. Now, in the third one, you saw that when the primary booster was given, the titers reached incrementally very high, 700 and thereabouts. Now, that is mainly because of this transformation to memory B cell. That is scenario number 1. Now, let us take scenario number 2. This was a student, just to be mindful, who developed an upper respiratory tract infection at a very cataral phase and then recovered very quickly within a week or so without the aid of antibiotics. Now, imagine this virtually in a patient where there is an organism entering the respiratory tract, maybe a virus in this context. What happens here is virus itself is nothing but organism, it harbors certain molecules which are called antigens and these antigens like I mentioned earlier with the B lymphocytes have an affinity to bind to antigen receptor binding sites which are usually on the surface of the T cells. Now, the T cells just to elaborate the picture a little bit, you can see this is the surface of the T lymphocyte and you have the receptor complex. The one in the center of your screen are what are called as alpha and beta as designated on the screen there which are held together by disulfide bonds. Another supporting characters to this are what are called as CD3 proteins. Now, they have a very vital role to play because in conjunction with your alpha and beta subunits, these CD3 molecules are important in signal transduction. Another important component at the far end of your screen on the left is what is called as zeta chains. Zeta chains when combined with these three CD3 proteins and the alpha and beta subunit form what are called as T cell receptor complex. Now, why elaborate on this? This is important because as an antigen is incident upon the site for their binding, it is brought in with the help of what is called as antigen presenting cell. These antigen presenting cells have on their surface molecules called as major histocompatibility complex or HLA complexes and they present the antigens in a form which is best recognized by T cells with a CD4 or 8. Just to digress at this point, we will come back to this image in couple of slides. A little bit of MHC molecule, what are they? They are nothing but a set of genes with the highly polymorphic alleles which are located on chromosome 6 on the short arm. Why do we have them? They are mainly important because they produce what is called as polymorphisms in the allele expression. They are also referred to as HLA because in humans it was discovered first in the leukocytes. What do they do? Now, MHC molecules have what are called as class 1 and class 2. Class 1 molecules are located mainly in all nucleated cells and the platelets. The gene encoding for the same are HLA, A, B and C, but more importantly or central to our understanding to what they do during the T cell receptor complex is this. That is, they display peptides like I told you in the form or a shape which are best recognized by the T cells. That is. A C class 1 molecule usually displays peptides which are intracellular, that is either a virus or a tumor and they are recognized by only CD8 lymphocytes. So, this is what is called as class restriction. So, CD8 lymphocytes will recognize peptides or antigen only when presented in conjunction with MHC class 1 molecules. This restriction is very important because the reaction is very specific. In contrast, MHC class 2 molecule are located on the B lymphocytes. They can be located on the macrophages and also on the dendritic cells. They are very versatile in nature. The composition is relatively the same, but the gene encoding for them are slightly different. You have HLA DP, DQ or DR, but like I said, the role that they play is to display the peptides which are usually derived from extracellular microbes and soluble proteins. So, they are recognized by CD cells which are 4, CD4 lymphocytes and they are recognizable only when they are restricted with class 2. So, just to reinforce, MHC molecules are important. MHC class 2 restriction is associated with CD4 lymphocytes and 
MHC class 1 restriction is associated with CD8 lymphocytes. A simple algorithm is 4 into 2 is 8 and 8 into 1 is 8, meaning CD4 molecules along with MHC class 2 is 8, whereas CD8 lymphocytes recognizes with the help of MHC class 1 molecule. Now, we will come back to this T cell again. Right now, we have seen the role of MHC molecule. It has presented a peptide in a form and a shape which is palatable. Now, that is recognized by the alpha and beta subunits. So, there is a conformational change in this receptor complex and it produces what is called as at the bottom of your screen, you can see signal 1. Signal 1 is not enough to produce an activation of the cell, just like in the case of B lymphocytes that we have seen earlier. It also requires the aid of another molecule, which is in the far end of your screen there, which is CD28. Now, CD28 binds with certain epitopes such as CD80 or 86 and gets activated and produces what is called as signal 2. Now, signal 1 and signal 2 are both required for the cell to function. Should you have only signal 1 and no signal 2, the cell is above the baseline but not able to mount a response. So, it is rendered unreactive or it may dedicate itself to cell death which is called as apoptosis. But in the presence of both the signals that is signal 1 and signal 2, you have an activated cell which can perform multiple functions including differentiation into another form. So, now let us try to understand the grand picture in case scenario 2. Now, you had a respiratory tract infection where the microbes were picked up by the dendritic cells in the upper respiratory tract as they move towards the, the, sorry, the microbes were picked up by the dendritic cells and processed. And these dendritic cells are very versatile. Not only are they at a very vantage point, they can also transport themselves to different sites in the body. As you can see on your screen there, your dendritic cells which are harboring now the microorganisms in a processed form, then move towards what are called as the lymphatic channels. And then through the conduits, which are the lymphatic channels, they reach the lymphocytes. Through the conduits, which are the lymphatic channel, they reach the nodes, which are the lymph nodes. In the lymph node, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, the lymph permeates through the cortex and towards the medulla and carries all these antigens and the dendritic cells with it to the center and also in the paracortical zone. Now, the paracortical zone from a days of histology we know are rich in T lymphocytes, both CD4 and CD8. As you can see here, if the MHC molecule that is associated with this dendritic cell is class 1, it will activate your CD8 cells. Like I said, the 8 into 1 is 8. If the dendritic cell is harboring a molecule which is of class 2 MHC, it will activate your CD4. 4 into 2 is 8. Now, here you can see the CD4 cells once they are activated, they become what are called as effector T cells. Effector T cells can be of Th1 type or Th17 type, which will come to a bit uh, later. If it is CD8 cells which are activated, they are very robust. What they do is they release a lot of perforins and granzymes and activate the napatotic mechanism within the interested cell. As you can see, the CD8 cells will become what are called as suppressor T cells in function. One of the subset of the T cell is what is called as effector T cell, which we touched upon just a while back. Now, these effector T cells migrate through the blood channels and reach the sites of interest. Once they migrate, what they do is import importantly, they transform into Th1 and Th17 cells, which, which are a storehouse of cytokines. So, they will recruit all like-minded members to the tissue. For example, you can see the macrophages here. The macrophages which have ingested all these microbial organisms become more potentiated. So, what they do is they kill the ingested microbes. So, that is an important mechanism. What effector T cells also do because of the release of cytokines is activate the neutrophils. The neutrophils just as you have learned from chapters in inflammation will progress towards the site of injury and produce phagocytic activity. The third important function is killing of the infected cells mainly by CD8 cells, which is usually due to apoptosis and the entire cell harboring the microbial organism will be completely destroyed. Uh, this is what has happened in the case scenario number 2 to just jog your memory back, where at the end of day 7 or day 8, 
the infection which is the upper respiratory tract infection was completely resolved. As they say, if you have a common cold, if you do not treat it, it resolves by the A7. If you take an antibiotic, it resolves within one week. So, it is just that. So, what has happened here? So, those are the distinctions between cases 1 and 2. Just to underline what has happened, B lymphocytes react to microbes and they get transformed to plasma cells which produce a lot of antibodies which are called as antibody secretions and they retain a memory of the same. CD4 cells or helper T lymphocytes will recognize the microbial system in conjunction with MHC class 2 and release cytokines after they transform into effector T cells. Now, these can activate either your macrophages, it can recruit inflammatory cells or it can even stimulate the B lymphocytes to a very stimulated form. The CD8 cytotoxic T cells are directly responsible for killing the infected cells harboring the microbial insult resulting in an effective termination of the microbial insult. Now, what happens to this? Should this go on forever? No, everything has a certainty to it which is an end point. Usually, there is a decline of such an immune response and retention of memory. This is also an important step in the immune system. What happens to these effector T cells eventually? Once there is an elimination of the peptide or antigen which has stimulated it in the first place, they undergo what is called as programmed cell death or apoptosis but it leaves behind an imprint which is your memory cells which retain a memory of the inciting insult. And if in case there is a future insult of a similar nature, they are all armed and ready to recruit a lot of like minded cells bringing in an effective immune response. So, this was in brief about the pathophysiology of the immune system, what it does in normal default setting. Obviously, these have pros and cons. The pros being you have a good immune system, but what if the immunity is too low? What is the problem if the immunity is too high? These are important tenets that needs to be understood and possibly we will tackle them in the future classes. Thank you.